great okay it does work so um i'll stop for yes 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 okay hi it's liz wishka here at st mary's hospital in paddington um and it gives me great pleasure to uh very gratefully welcome uh, professor gary wong uh, who's uh, from hong kong who is joining us today to talk about his experiences of managing um, uh, coronaviruses in a Chinese Hong Kong setting. Um, so Professor uh, Gary Wong um, graduated in Canada and, um, and trained both in British Columbia and Canada as well as in Germany and is pre predominantly an, an allergy respiratory consultant who works I think uh, with Adnan from a collaborative perspective here at St Mary's. Um, he's been the president of the Asia Pacific Academy of Pediatric Allergy, Respiratory and Immunology Medicine um, and is one of the board of directors of the World Allergy Organization. So really amazing credentials and currently is also an associate editor at the New England Journal of Medicine. So I think we're really looking forward to hearing your talk and thank you so much for, um, for taking part in this today and we really look forward to hearing your experiences. So I'll let you take over. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity of uh, discussing with you with this really a major problem. And uh, I think to, to try to understand the scope of the problem, we may start with, you know, a little bit of historic aspect before we go right into COVID-19. And uh, let me just, okay, let me go down. Now, here are the numbers as of yesterday, and I'm sure you were well aware, it started out in uh, late December and early January in central China and now it's uh, all over the world with close to 400,000 cases and the numbers are skyrocketing every day and uh, these pictures here you know really remind me what what Hong Kong was like in the early 2003 when we had the SARS and no one in the street this is really strange and as you can see the as of today, these are the numbers. Just you know, two weeks ago was a few hundred, and I think the latest number from the UK, it's more than 8,000 cases. And I, I guess it really depends on how hard you work in terms of doing the test. The more tests you're going to do, the more cases you're going to identify. And uh, now, if you look back uh, 17 years ago, when there was SARS and then Hong Kong happened to be in a location very close to China and uh, whatever big problem happened in China very often because of the number of people coming down to China from China to visit Hong Kong very often they bring the virus so we had the avian flu we had the H5N1 we had the SARS and of course now we had not so bad we had you know cases of COVID-19 and if one look at the story of you know coronavirus causing significant human disease you know there are a couple causing respiratory upper respiratory tract infection but the story really started you know with chapter one in 2002 when there was SARS well of course the, you know the the virus got this name from this crown like structure and as i've mentioned you know we know these four common viruses causing mild upper respiratory tract infection but the really bad one started in 2002 2003 with sars and then 2012 with mers and now a, a very common one now the sars cov2 can't leave our poo and anger well, the chapter one started in southern China in late 2002 and the story really went to Hong Kong and then spread to the world, rest of the world because there was an infected doctor from China and uh, he saw what was happening in southern China and he came down to Hong Kong to get care. But unfortunately, this was what happened. The doctor came into a hotel in central Kowloon and quite a few guests were infected in this hotel. And uh, one of, a couple of the patients were admitted to our hospital and spread to almost 100 healthcare worker in our hospital. And as the story goes, if you will recall, you know, you know, visitors uh, brought the disease back to Vietnam and start the outbreak there and to Singapore and a couple of patients in the US, Ireland, and also start a small outbreak in Toronto, Canada. But by and large, you know, it was a big problem 
but it really didn't affect that many countries around the world. And uh, the stories of SARS in children is very different. Well, when we look at the adult mortality, it's more like 10% globally. And when we look at most children, I have and I recall the very first patient admitted to our hospital who just had a little bit of a stuffy nose. And I look after that child. And at that time, I had no protective gear on. I was lucky I didn't catch it. And uh, it's more like a mass of mild respiratory tract syndrome than really SARS in the adult. And of course, the natural host was found to be in bats and a couple of intermediate hosts, which believe is uh, the bridge that bring the infection into humans. And the success of control has nothing to do with the availability of effective drugs or vaccine. It was simply identifying the virus, development of the rapid test. And the disease is very different from COVID-19 is that when a patient started to develop symptoms and that's the time they start to excrete the virus. So it's easy, once you diagnose them, you isolate them, you can practically stop the disease. And basically that was the tools being used back then in 2003, after a few months, the infection was contained and it was kind of you know, removed from circulation from humans. But at the end, more than 8,000 uh, patients were infected. Here you can see the map of where the patients were. And uh, at the end, about uh, 800 patients died from SARS uh, during that epidemic. The chapter two started in the Middle East. And it was, of course, named as Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And as you see, the distribution of the cases primarily in uh, uh, the Arab countries with visitors bringing the disease back, you know, a few here and there. And one of the largest outbreak was actually in uh, Korea. And this disease compared to SARS is even worse. The mortality is, was close to 25 to 50% as opposed to 10% in SARS. But another feature very similar to SARS is that there are very few pediatric cases and among them, you know, about 35 cases, there were two deaths. One with cystic fibrosis and the other one was a nephrotic, a patient with nephrotic syndrome on steroid. So by and large, it appears again, this disease is quite mild in children. Well, the current chapter of coronavirus infection, you know, the you know, scientists are still working on what exactly would be the intermediate host, but obviously quite the data is very strong that it comes from bats, but you know, most of the population in China, they, they don't really eat bats, so somehow probably you know, need an intermediate host. The early thought was maybe related to snakes, but there are accumulating evidence. Maybe it has to do with uh, the pangolin, this animal that is a price creature, apparently with some sort of medicinal value. And it started here in central China. Uh, they have a very big uh, high-speed station train station, which basically goes to the rest of the country. So it's a big central city with 10 million population. And uh, so quickly, the virus was identified after a couple of weeks, and it was the first report reporting the disease as well as the sequence of this virus in the New England Journal of Medicine. And if one looked back at the phylogenetics, this but uh, this virus is distinctly different from SARS-CoV-1 and distinctly different from MERS-CoV. And when one look at the time frame of the problem, the first uh, report to the uh, World Health Organization by the Chinese CDC was uh, on December 31st. There was a 27 case of unexplained severe pneumonia in a hospital in Wuhan and alerting the WHO to watch out for that. And a week, about a week later, a little over a week, there was a first death from this initial cohort. And two days later, the sequence was released uh, on uh, a public platform about 
this infection and this virus. And then a couple of days later, because there were a lot of visitors uh, going from China to uh, Thailand, and there was cases in Thailand. And then a week later, there was a family that moved from Wuhan to uh, Shenzhen. Shenzhen is a city right above next to Hong Kong confirming they have never visited market and there was one child in this cluster confirming human to human transmission and because of that and then a couple of days later the first one day later a case of uh, the first case in the u.s was reported again and and that case was also treated with the new antiviral uh, reported in the new england journal of medicine and seeing the rapidity of the development and so many of the patients were affected in Wuhan and uh, the central government decided to lock down the cities and various cities within this Hubei province and uh, in this city there were 11 million people and in the whole province about 60 million so it's very similar to the population in the UK now the problem is now because on the 25th it was the Chinese New Year, and there's a tradition that a lot of the workers would stop working, you know, a few days prior to the Chinese New Year. Either people will be migrating out from Wuhan to the rest of the country to spend the time with the family during the Chinese New Year. So it's very, it turns out a lot of this visit actually brought that virus to the rest of the country. And the first case of COVID-19 was reported in the UK on January the 31st. Now, these are the first three series of adult patients published, uh, two in Lancet, one in JAMA. And as you can see here, the majority of the patients are the older male patients, a lot of with chronic disease. And looking back, it was, it's quite obvious these are the bias population of those who are most severe admitted to these two hospitals. And these two hospitals in Wuhan were the def designated hospital to look after adult patients with uh, uh, COVID-19. And one look at the mortality, it looks really scary. The first report came out, the conclusion from that paper was this infection is as worse or worse than SARS. But second report with a slightly larger uh, number of patients, the mortality went down. And then the third report went down even further. And the largest uh, description of the clinical presentation and course of the illness was in the New England Journal of Medicine, close to 1,100 patients. And the mortality is somewhere between one to 2%. Of course, we were uh, very interested in, in you know, as this infection, the infectivity is so high, you know, what would be the disease pattern or spectrum and manifestation in children too? And there was also a couple of reports of the pathology. Uh, this was, was the first one uh, published in Lancet Respiratory Medicine that they did post-mortem biopsy of the lungs, the liver, and the heart. And the pathological findings are very similar to that of SARS and MERS with a lot of inflammations in the lung, with uh, lymphocytic infiltration, ALDS, and formation of hyaline membrane. Very similar in terms of the pathology. And what about in children? You know, from late January to uh, uh, mid-February, there were quite a few reports. Uh, one in BMJ, one in J a couple in JAMA, a couple of case report uh, with small series. And, uh, one or two or eight pediatric cases in these separate reports. So we decided to look at this uh, systematically. We have a network of children hospital across China to collect all these cases. And right now we have a total of about 400. And this was the first analysis of the children just admitted to the Wuhan Children's Hospital, which is the only vaccinated hospital in the city to look after children under 16 years of age with the disease or suspect to have the disease. So let's look at the clinical features, the epidemiologic link, the radiologic features, as well as the laboratory features. The clinical outcome of this group, we uh, 
in the report of the New England journals up to uh, uh, March the 8th. Now, if you look at, we had a total, a cohort, 171 patients. As you can see here, the median age is uh, 6.7, ranging from the one day old newborn. There were two newborns in this series and up to 15 years of age. And as you see, you know, all children at all age uh, are affected. You know. In fact, you know, we see a slightly disproportionate more uh, infants under one year of age infected with the virus. And uh, in our cohort, similar to other respiratory tract problem, we see a slight male predominance. And uh, now, how do we get this patient? Now, these are the patients who, with respiratory tract symptoms, with pneumonia, refer to the Children's Hospital in Wuhan for assessment. And we also, get referral for all children with respiratory tract complaint. Within that family, there has been an adult confirmed or suspected to have COVID-19. And all these children, regardless of their level of severity, very no symptoms, very mild symptoms, or the more severe pneumonia, are all assessed in this hospital. So that's why in the end, we, in this cohort, we have 27 children who are asymptomatic. They simply had an adult in the family with confirmed or suspected disease, and we found the virus in the respiratory tract uh, sample. And here is that the median age is 6.7 years. So as you see, lots of infants. And overall, if one look at as you can see in the table later on, the asymptomatic children tends to be a little older. The median age is something like, like nine. And if we look at the epidemiologic link, the vast majority of these children, of course, as one would expect, because we screen these families, so eight, close to 80% of them had a family member, adult, confirmed to have the infection. But I would like to also mention that among these children, there were four children actually developed the symptoms first before the adult developed the symptoms. So whether the children were the index case in the family or whether the whole family were exposed to the same source with a shorter incubation period in the children, we're not sure. And if one look at you know, the symptomatology when they present. Now, this is important, you know, because in SARS, almost all of them develop fever. In this disease, less than half. So the strategy is using fever to screen patient would not work in picking up the children. And uh, in terms of the severity, as you can see here, only four of our children would be classified as more severe type of pneumonia. They have you know, a saturation using the cutoff of 92, not less than 92 in, uh, on room air. And at the end, these are the classification we had. Uh, 27 of them, so 16% asymptomatic, 20% of them with upper respiratory tract symptoms, and then 107 of them so 73% of them with pneumonia. But among these pneumonia, those because, well, at, at the beginning, we, we really do not know how sick the children may get. So even in the asymptomatic patient, we screen them with a chest CT to see whether there are changes in the, in the lung. And in fact, among these patients, there are, 11, there are 12 of them actually, they did not have any symptoms, but they have radiologic findings of pneumonia. And here, it, uh, the age breakdown, as you can see here, the asymptomatic children with a median age of nine, and then those with URI, 3.9, and those with pneumonia, six. So overall, the, as you can see here, there are no infants who are asymptomatic. They get sick, but not that sick. And I plot out the you know, saturation in room, uh, on room air at presentation of the first 100 patients. As you can see here, the vast majority of them, actually, they're not sick. 
And the red one was one of the patients that we admitted to the ICU and intubated for a week, a patient with underlying renal problem and hydronephrosis. And the patient presented with diarrhea and then quite dry and then subsequently developed renal failure and requiring dialysis and also respiratory failure. So maybe a combination of uh, a fluid overload plus the renal problem plus the respiratory problem may cause, you know, the uh, severe illness in that child. So if you look at you know, those without pneumonia and with, with pneumonia, they're really very mild pneumonia. So with very good saturation on room air at presentation. The laboratory features rather nonspecific. In the adult population, they always quote that lymphopenia is associated with more severe disease and admission to the ICU. But in our case, only, only six out of the 171 patients uh, had uh, lymphopenia. So it was a very uncommon. And uh, when we look at, you know, yes, these nonspecific uh, um, markers of procalcitonin and CRP and uh, uh, quite a per big percentage of them uh, elevated. And as one would expect it, you know, there are more patients in the pneumonia and UIY group with a higher uh, acute phase reaction and, Calcitonin. Now, one concentrate on the 132 patients with symptoms. And uh, now, of course, I would uh, caref be very careful interpreting the so called incubation period because, by pure recall, of when the first symptom appear in the family member sometimes can be very inaccurate. So, if we look at that, well, it took, you know, nine days or so before the child developed the symptoms. But if you look at those, you know, symptomatic children, they're relatively not, you know, most of them, you know, a little bit of fever, a little bit of coughing, dry coughing, and uh, for about one week or so, and they get over disease. In terms of those with fever, on average, the median is around three days, anywhere from one day to six days with the intercortical range here. And in terms of when they have the symptoms and we serially do samples of them until they're negative. And now on the safety side, if they have two consecutive negative swab 24 hours apart, we, you know, would, uh, the child can be come off, can come off isolation just on the safety side properly. It's a little bit excessive there. And uh, in terms of the radiologic findings, and these are the, the most common, actually the findings are very similar to the adult series. Over 30% uh, uh, of them, you see bilateral ground glass opacity. And one thing I should also mention in the clinical presentation, wheezing, it's not a finding in these children. In fact, in our uh, 171 patient, there was no asthmatic in our cohort with COVID-19 and it may be related to the receptor for this virus primarily in the lung alveolar type 2 cells and, and this, this receptor seems to be relatively, uh, you, you don't find these receptors in the epithelium, bronchial epithelium. And maybe that's the reason why they do not have much of an airway disease or rather they have alveolar disease. And these are the findings. That's the top two uh, CT scan are from the patients with dihydronephrosis and, uh, and intubated in the intensive. As you can see here, the, the bilateral, you know, these ground glass type of opacities and other patient with uh, similar findings. And then the next two CT, this is a patient with pneumonia, the symptomatic patient, you see the patch there. And this is a patient is an asymptomatic 15 year old with a little bit of, you know, patchy consolidation in the right lower uh, zone. Now, if you look at these kids, you know, this is one of the infants that got infected. And uh, that's the uh, uh, school age kid also infected with a bit of pneumonia. They are not that sick. Now, the severity, the four patients that uh, required uh, a little bit more treatment and three of them admitted to the intensive care unit and have respiratory failure. So, so we work out the numbers, 1.8% of them required intubation. 
And I mentioned about this boy who uh, uh, developed hydronephrosis and respiratory failure and renal failure, requiring dialysis. And after uh, mechanical ventilation for a week, he came off uh, the ventilator and he recovered and was discharged. The other patient uh, was also in the ICU. It was a child with uh, leukemia receiving uh, maintenance chemotherapy and developed respiratory failure. And the child actually did quite well and came off the ventilator. And, uh, but unfortunately, probably because of the underlying condition, the patient spiked up another fever again and, uh, and we had to uh, reintubate it. Uh, this patient a few days ago and went back into the ICU uh, right now. In fact, in the whole cohort here, that uh, is the remaining patient in the Wuhan Children's Hospital. There's only one death case. This case is very special. This 10-month-old actually came in with vomiting for a day and a half and prolonged crying, the classic symptoms of intersusception. And when the patient came to the hospital, the patient had current jelly stool. And of course, the diagnosis by then was very easy. And the intersusception was reduced. And after reduction, the, the child had a really stormy course with dehydration and then renal failure and then spike up a fever. And then the lungs start to uh, turn into ground glass. And, uh, and, and then the PCR turn was positive. So we're not sure whether actually the start of the infection actually is in the gut. As you know, there were quite a few reports there. A lot of patients, when they clear up the PCR uh, uh, virus from their respiratory tract, they still kind of excrete, they can, we can still detect uh, viral copies in the stool. It could be uh, this started out in the gut and uh, we're not sure. So that was the only death case. And we had another data set come, uh, came in from Shenzhen, the city right next to Hong Kong and a smaller series, 34 cases. And uh, in uh, between uh, January 19 to February the 9th. And uh, as you can see here again, you know, you know, infants, toddlers, you know, school age and adolescent, we have them all. And again, the majority of them have household contact and many of them are from the Hubei province. And again, you know, about half of them's got fever and the rest, the majority of very mild pneumonia and upper respiratory tract symptoms. And very similar to the presentation the distribution in the Wuhan cohort. And in this series, there was no ICU case and, and the x-ray was very similar to the Wuhan cohort. Now, I mentioned earlier, uh, in our series, of course, there are a big percentage of patients, very mild disease or asymptomatic. And this data from a series from adult published uh, as a correspondence in the New England Journal, is very, illustrated there are patients that are symptomatic, very mild, and asymptomatic in this series. And if you look at the nasal secretion and the throat secretion, the number of copies, actually there are no different. So suggesting those with asymptomatic infection shed just as many virus as those with symptoms. So this is very important. Uh, uh, public health implication in terms of stopping the chain of transmission. Here you see the team in Wuhan Children Hospital. This is the chief of pediatric respirology in Wuhan Children Hospital, Professor Lu. And uh, of course, they, as you can see, the, the protective equipment there. And they were, after looking after uh, about uh, 300 PCR positive patients and a few more hundred with similar presentation, but the PCR was negative and uh, they had no spread of infection to any healthcare worker in Wuhan Children Hospital. So I guess to me, when I look back at, and we, right now actually, they have no new case. And in Hong Kong, we are diagnosing about 20 to 30 cases every day. And many of them are students studying in the UK. And right now we have a couple of uh, patients in our ward uh, 
and they're not very sick. These adolescents tend not to get very sick. And also these students are, stu uh, are otherwise healthy students without chronic disease. So I do not expect a lot of problem uh, among this group. But the problem is if they carry the virus, they can start the chain of transmission in Hong Kong. So to me, the, the number one priority for controlling these infections really is the infection control. There are a lot of asymptomatic, uh, mild patients, and they don't really need much of treatment. We isolate them, not really to treat them and protect them. The goal actually finding this group of patients is really to prevent the spreading infection to other vulnerable groups of patients. And those with pneumonia, the vast majority of them are just like any other self-limiting viral pneumonia. Only about 10% of them uh, in children, 20% of them in adults, they have a little bit of, you know, the more moderate to severe. And of course, is uh, uh, we can discuss a little bit, you know, what should be the most appropriate treatment strategies uh, for this group of patients. And the one or two percent of patients, especially those with underlying uh, medical conditions, um, uh, will require ICU care. And in the, the adult, of course, you know, when you do the intubation, and it's a very high risk procedure, generally a lot of aerosols. And in fact, in, in Wuhan, in many centers in China, they have a, of course, if there is big enough volume, and they did, they have a special team doing the intubation because they're so well protected. And um, so on. And I, and I heard uh, there was building of these uh, temporary site to house these patients. And it's, uh, I'm not a public health person, but what I learned from the lessons in Hong Kong and in China is that, and that's what we do, you know, you have a large number of these patients, asymptomatic and mild, and very little bit of the pneumonia. These patients really, they don't need to be in the hospital. And in fact, it would be a waste of resources. We need to isolate them so that they don't pass the virus along. And these are really the patients we need to look after in the hospital. And this is the treatment strategy that, that uh, they use in Wuhan Children Hospital. And there were, there were, were only two cases with co-infection with flu A, and they were treated with Tamiflu. And, uh, and about a fraction of them, they were suspect to have bacterial infection. They were treated with antibiotics. And, and there was basically you know, severe complicating bacterial pneumonia. It's not a feature of this uh, disease. Uh, the more severe patient, they did use a little bit of CRI, and this time compared to uh, SARS, which they use quite high dose steroid, and uh, they did not this time. Uh, and I'm not an intensive care specialist. I guess uh, the intensive care colleague would be able to make the best judge whether they would like to use a uh, steroid for the treatment of uh, ARDS. And now in China, there is this very special preparation you see in the right lower hand corner here. And uh, I, I was told, I was given a couple of uh, papers in Chinese, a few small trials saying, you know, this thing you squirt into the throat in patient with RSV, apparently there is something, you know, in their data suggests it, it helps a little bit and uh, interferon alpha. Uh, I think to me, it's probably a, a, a little bit of a, uh, interesting placebo. And in terms of treatment trials that have been published, and this was the trial using the combination of lopinavir and ritonavir, and uh, well, this is the result. And doesn't look very promising, although the trial is relatively small, it's 199 patients, but in terms of the symptoms, their primary outcome, and then of uh, and the viral shedding, it doesn't seem to help at all. So as the story go with these three chapters and the other four, you know, very mild virus, mild uh, virus causing very mild disease, and there we are. And I don't think this chapter three is the final chapter. And if one look back comparing the outbreak of SARS 2002 and three, and 
and 2019-2020. Now, back then, very similar, in the winter time, there was a case of the typical pneumonia, and there was a lot of outbreak uh, in different places. In South China, eventually, it brought to Hong Kong because of the doctor seeking treatment in February and spread to the rest of the world. And eventually, after an, another you know, six to eight weeks before the virus were identified. Now you can imagine at that time we were working here in Hong Kong, we have outbreaks and, and then you see patients coming in, you see your colleagues falling ill and we had no idea what the virus was. Very difficult back then. I would say looking back this time around, it's much, much easier, at least for us in Hong Kong, that we were very aggressive in controlling the movement of people you know, massive upscale in our testing capability and test as many people as possible and isolated those infected. As you can see here, you know, the virus sequence were identified there. And, and in China, now this is what happened in Wuhan. You probably have seen some of these pictures because of the massive outbreak. And then because of the lockdown in the Hubei province. They know they're gonna see a lot of patients. So they built two hospitals, this is one of them. And in late January and early February, and a couple of days later, they start taking in patients. So there is over a thousand beds in this, you know, not bad looking, you know, te temporary hospital. And of course, they also have 12 other temporary hospitals scattered around in Wuhan. These are from, you know, community hall, sports facility. Basically, this is what I say would be for those mildly symptomatic patients who would be collected because 80% of the patients will belong to that category. There's no point of using acute care beds. You know, you basically need babysitter to look after them here. And when they do develop more severe illness, they would be transported to the, a couple of general hospitals and the two large temporary hospitals. And as of uh, March the 12th, all the 12 temporary hospitals has been shut down and the last patient's been discharged. So now there are only the acute care hospital looking after a couple thousand patients in Wuhan. If you look back over the last 20 odd years or so, you will see, you know, in Hong Kong, the H5N1, and at that time, the casualty was very high for chickens. We killed, I think, a million uh, poultry at that time. And, uh, but there were, I think, about uh, a couple of mortality, I told us six or seven cases in our hospital. And then SARS took a big toll, and there were close to 300 deaths in Hong Kong. And then as the story goes, you heard about, you know, the various viruses, new virus, and then the MERS, and now the COVID-19. And it's a matter of time that the next virus will come. So we better be prepared. Yeah, I think it would be nice to summarize looking at, and this is uh, a Nobel laureate in 1968, Joshua Lederberg, who wrote, uh, a piece, a scientific piece in science, when he looked at the various type of infection, outbreak or epidemic in the 20th century. And, uh, and I quote, the future of humanity and microbes likely will unfold as episodes of a suspense thriller. That could be titled, Our Wits Versus Their Genes. And to fight this, now, Wuhan and Hubei, the province, has a population similar to the UK. So with the lockdown, you can imagine, and I understand this must be in the human history, one of the biggest lockdown or quarantine of uh, close to 60 million people. And there are a lot of patients there. So the healthcare team in Wuhan won't be able to look after that many patients. So you can see here the various teams from different provinces with hundreds to thousands of healthcare workers and a total of 42,000 went into Wuhan to look after the patients. And I heard, you know, this is the front page of your Sunday, uh, the Sun front page calling for more doctors and you will need a lot of doctors and ho hopefully uh, the 
in, in UK, things will turn around and you would not overwhelm the ICU because once the ICU of OVM, and that's exactly what happening in Italy. And unfortunately, you know, Italy actually is, has a population similar to the size of Hubei. But unfortunately, Italy cannot get doctors from Switzerland or France to come in to help to look after their patients. And a bit of good news for you, as of March 18, that was the first day there was no local transmission in the whole of China, no local transmission in the Wuhan province. And a professor, you know, on her way out to the hospital, took this uh, cherry blossom picture and sent it to me. And uh, the lockdown will be lifted on April 8th in Wuhan. And the lift has already been done in the other uh, areas in Wubei. So, so no matter how harsh and how cold the winter is, spring will come. So, and I think you guys can do it. And thank you. I'll stop here and take any comments or questions. Oh, thanks so much, Gary. That was um, really. Hmm. Cannot hear you. Oh, sorry, my fault. Um, oh, that's good. Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, so sorry. So what I was saying is thank you very much. That was really great. Um, there are some questions on chat. And mm -hmm. if anybody else has any other questions on chat, um, if you type them in, I'll try and ask them. So I'm going to start with a question from our uh, local nephrology consultant, um, Sandra Suttle, who's just saying, um, because it's interesting that you had this child with hydronephrosis. Um, yes. Pediatric patients who had severe symptoms and a renal background um, were they kind of end-stage renal disease? Do they have significant proteinuria? Oh, no, no, not at all. This child was just have uh, uh, some obstructive hydronephrosis. And in fact, uh, the premorbid condition is such that the child renal function was quite well. Yeah, I think it was, the problem was uh, the child developed a lot of vomiting and diarrhea. The child was quite dry when the child was admitted to hospital. Okay. And I think that was the complicating reason. But the child, this child did quite well. Okay, so it's maybe coincidental rather than... That's I right, it's just that's English. right. And I think that brings that's us right. to the same to the next question, which is from um, Adnan, which is just and a question that's coming up a lot for us in terms of trying to protect the vulnerable, is yes. in terms of immunocompromised patients, um, yes. uh, did you see many children affected? We're, we hear from our colleagues in Italy, and I think they're about to publish a report showing mm -hmm. that there was no increase in severe uh, complications in immunocompromised patients, either adults or children, compared to the general population. Um, yeah, that's, that's probably also our impression with the pediatric uh, cases, because in the whole of China, there's over a thousand cases in our uh, uh, collection from various hospitals. We have close to about 600 patients. And I'm aware of two deaths, and uh, one, the intersusception, the other one with underlying leukemia. Yeah. And, and there are, uh, I, I'm not aware of any specific, you know, you know, mild or moderate or severe type of immunodeficient patient developing severe COVID-19 disease. Okay, and then I guess the other cohort of patients that we um, are here, we have here, and that actually the first couple of admissions to our intensive care unit had were children with neurodisability, um, mm -hmm. underlying lung problems, and I think yes. We, a relatively large proportion of children of that phenotype in the UK and I wondered if they were represented amongst the patients that you've seen or heard of in China. Yes, a couple of them with the neurologic problem and in fact in our series one of the other patients was quite ill was a child who had neurologic damage from motor vehicle accident and probably because this child had previous, you know, various lung infections and he received uh, a non-invasive ventilation. We were very reluctant actually, you know, because with the non-invasive, it might potentially generate a lot of aerosols. That was a slightly sicker patient that we, we see, and that's correct. Okay, because I think that that's probably the type of patients we'll see being particularly unwell. And I think one of the that's ethical right. dilemmas we're facing here is um, is we've set up a, an ethics committee to, to to have conversations about which patients are most appropriate to put on ventilators because of right. our limited capacity and and making those kinds of decisions is very stressful for everyone. 
Um, that's yeah, that's yeah. right. You know, overall, I think from the you know about a thousand cases that we have seen, it it appears that actually the the most at risk are those the oncology patients, the pediatric oncology patients. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, the, the asthmatic, as I said, you know, in oh, yeah. our cohort, there are no asthmatic. And these kids do not wheeze when they get infected. Yeah, we haven't put that, 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 is, that is interesting, because we're currently isolating and testing children presenting mm -hmm. with wheeze. Um, so I guess we may end up with um, some interesting data based on that, which might sure. correlate with what you've said. Sure. There's yeah. a couple of other questions. Uh, one is, um, so one of the big questions that came up here was whether or not ibuprofen uh, led to increased severity of other non steroidal anti inflammatories. And I wondered whether there was any concern about that um, at your yeah. event. Well, um, it's good that in, in the Hong Kong or in China, uh, they don't use much of ibuprofen. And uh, personally, I, I don't like using antipyretics anyway. And a little bit of fever doesn't really kill the child. And, uh, and of course, parents request them, but I. I, I do not know whether the use of ibuprofen was, you know, make it worse or make it better. And uh, I don't know, but. Yeah, so I think we're, we're sticking with the try and use paracetamol first line um, and only use it if you need it, but. That's right, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the other questions, that were a couple of questions coming at you. So do, we, do you think, or is there an anticipation that there might be another surge when, you, when lockdown is lifted? And I guess related to that, do we have any serological mm. data on how much of the population was infected in the end. So I know the numbers would have looked yeah. like 1% of the population yeah. in Wuhan, yeah. but obviously yeah. there may be more yeah. that were not detected, but that might have uh, yeah. specifically been detected by serology. Do you have any information yeah. on that? Yeah, we, we are collecting uh, data, as you can, can understand, you know, because the city and the province has been locked down mm -hmm. and uh, basically you cannot access whatever type of uh, children that you want to access. And once the lockdown is lifted, we will do a proportional sample of the population and see, you know, what, you know, what percentage of populations got serologic evidence of the infection and uh, and try to tease out the, the risk factor for some of the severe ones and uh, what could explain the severity in some of them. Yes. Yeah, we, I think that, that information is going to be really crucial to get that's out right. as quickly exactly. as we get the case reports because it will help to inform policy in the rest of the world, I think. That's right. Um, yes. So yes. the other question yeah. that's coming up that we've also discussed at this end is how you de-isolate somebody. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of, did you very good. Uh, did you do that on results, or did you do that on clinical, or how did you? Yeah, do very that? very good. Uh, now, as I showed you earlier, if one look at those symptomatic patients first, it they usually get better in about a week or so. And if we look at the PCR of the respiratory samples, they will become negative in about two weeks, and. Uh, and we pick this very safe cutoff of so-called, you know, they have two negative PCR. Okay. I think we're overdoing it. Yeah. If you ask me, if I have, you know, see real, you know, look at the real live variants on them, you know, just because they're shedding a few, you know, copies of the virus, most likely dead virus, doesn't mean they are infective. And um, so I think we are on the safe side yeah. of doing that. And that's why I think in Wuhan in particular, it's very safe. What happened is they basically test everyone who potentially could be infected. And so the amount of testing done is enormous. So I would not have a big worry of, you know, when they lift the lockdown, there will be another surge. But of course, they would be looking at it very carefully. Yeah, because yeah. there's a big difference between the one, and I know that your lockdown was early and probably much better than ours, but there's a big difference between the 1% infected and the 80% projected. I know mm -hmm. it's a scenario in many Western countries, and it's interesting. it'll be, I guess, time will tell. Um, That's right. Yeah, yeah. So the other, mm -hmm. thank you very much for the data on the lopinavir ritonavir. Um, I think mm -hmm. the other big, I mean, we're busy developing treatment guidelines here and right. the, the azithromycin hydroxychloroquine. Yes, yes. That paper is yeah. obviously not a great paper, but I wondered yeah. um, if you had any insight into the role of either of those medications. Now, this combina these combinations have been used in a very 
you know, non-systematic way in uh, different places. And particularly for children, because the vast majority of the children are so mild that it, I can envision, you know, particularly if you look at pediatric, it's going to be very difficult to tease out what's going on. And yeah. I would love to see some, you know, good quality uh, RCT similar to the, to the Kalitra trial in the adults to, to guide us a little bit. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I guess, you know, given the, I mean, we know the anti-malarial is quite well and uh, the safety profile. And I think if, if, if you ask me, if I have a severe patient right now, you know, you know, if we possibly think of the, po the treatment, probably I would think, you know, hydroxychloroquine plus the, the macrolides probably would be a reasonable combination. Yeah, but I think, I, 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 but, yeah. but it has, because you, you I, I hope you're not going to see that many patients. You guys don't say, you know, you, you have patients to do this trial, but I hope you do not have the patient to do this trial. Exactly. You know? I think that, but, to, to be honest, to give you the feel for what's happening in the UK is that there mm -hmm. um, is a very clear steer from the government that patients should be adult patients, should be receiving any treatment they sure. get within the right. within a randomized control trial, because otherwise it's very hard to come to any conclusions. But children have been excluded right. from most of those trials because our numbers are anticipated to be low and because yeah. there was bias in terms of the patients we think will end up in intensive yeah. care. And so yeah. actually yeah. there is access for children to get uh, remdesivir yeah. um, under mm -hmm. compassionate use, but I have real questions about whether I, I doubt that's right personally. but i doubt it because of the number of cases in the u.s i don't know the supply of remdesivir you know if if uh, hydroxychloroquine is available yeah. and you have a protocol to treat adults in a trial setting i don't see the reason why not including children over 12 years of age you know yeah. in the trial. We are, we're pushing back against the we're trying to make it to 40 kilos or 12 years and i think sure. we'll probably have some success there but hopefully still not be able to include very many um, and yeah. I guess the other thing that's been really interesting is that I don't know if you've seen the Italian treatment um, guideline is that mm -hmm. they're using um, ribavirin quite widely as well, which I think um, is it also slightly without evidence. Well, from from what I know from the SARS literature, SARS-CoV-1, and uh, it doesn't work. No. And uh, no, it doesn't work. Yeah, mm -hmm. that would have been our instinct, but it's just interesting, and I don't know how much of that is based on slight desperation. Yeah. It's also yeah. such a toxic drug that using it empirically, you know, yeah. kind of feels a little bit out of I'm just trying to scroll down because there's one message. Okay. Yeah. So, so actually, sorry, um, I have another question here, which is just about the child of the interception. Do they mm -hmm. have a post mortem? Unfortunately, no. And. Uh... See, this thing, um, I, I try to convince uh, the team and, 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 and some, uh, they were not able to get it. Yeah. Okay. I guess the question is, it's very interesting, the gastroenterology perspective of this virus in terms yes. of presentations in the literature. It looks like 14% of patients are presenting with, with gastro diarrhea. Yeah, diarrhea. Some, some, and, that's right. And, yeah, and so I think that the uh, role of um, replication within the gut is quite interesting, and I think particularly yes. in the context of your case. Um, That's right. Yeah, it would be interesting. Yeah, it would be interesting to see. You know, you know, yes, the PCR is positive. We would like you know look at the, you know, copies of live variants in the, you know, zoo, and how long would they actually? That appears from some of the literature being published in the last couple of weeks or so. You know, you can detect. A sh shorter period of time, you know, about two weeks or so in the, the airway secretion. But in the gut, sometimes you can detect it up to three, four weeks. You can yeah. still detect the variants. Yeah. I've seen that data. Mm -hmm. So the next yeah. question is about PPE because your photographs of, of staff wearing PPE are um, show that you're, you're, you were wearing quite extensive personal protective equipment in terms of full gowns and booties and hoods. That's and right. Yeah. Goggles That's and right. visors. And I think that in the UK, the public health uh, policy has been that uh, patient staff, healthcare workers should wear FFP3 or N95 masks with a visor mm -hmm. um, and gowns and gloves for aerosol generating procedures only or in high risk areas. And then yes. the rest of the population is advised to wear a surgical um, mm -hmm. mask. And this is based, I think, on the meta-analysis of um, the benefit of masks during the SARS outbreak in 2003. Right. Right. Paper. 
Um, yes. And uh, I wasn't sure what do you think about that. I mean, you guys obviously went down a completely different route. Um, it's, it's generating a lot of anxiety here. Yes. Um, yeah. And I, yeah, I, you know, I, I think um, yeah, certainly, you know, from the recommendation, you know, as you can see here, you, you, there are teams here. These are the more the supportive staff, you know, the one in blue gowns. Yeah. You know, they bring in and out and things. And these are the pe people who with the, uh, the complete gown and the shield and the N95, these actually, they have contact and do procedures on the patient. And uh, so that's why there, there's these two type, you know, slightly more, you know, protection. And I think it has to do with the availability. You yeah. know, it, to them, you know, it's widely available. It's available to them. They would rather you know, if there is a 1% chance of catching the infection, they rather wear this. And, and of course, you know, in fact, you know, once they put this on, you know, because they have to do a buddy system, you know, you, and, and they cannot get, you know, change, you know, okay. for going to the washroom. Basically, once they're in it, they, they do a six hour shift without so changing. So we right, so. our original plan was that, so basically for patients, for staff who were uh, donning that level of PPE, the feeling mm -hmm. was really that two hours is probably about as long as most people can tolerate working yeah. in that environment. So it's interesting that your staff were doing, I mean, that we know that it's written that you can do six hours. And I guess yeah. the question is how feasible that is in real life settings. That's right, and, yeah. yeah. So yeah. just there's a question mm -hmm. here from our respiratory professor saying, uh, given the safety profile of azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine, um, how many people think a placebo controlled trial would be ethical, I guess? And do you mean because it's so safe and whether or not we should be doing a randomized control trial or just gathering data? <laughs> you know, exactly uh, right. Is it so safe that we, I mean, who, who, of, who of the audience would listen, would enroll themselves in such a trial? Um, as, as in to, with the risk of being in a placebo group? Yeah. Yes, yes exactly. I mean, rigorous, <laughs> rigorous science, yes. Do a randomized controlled trial. Um, Aubrey, I see, would enroll himself. I would enroll. Caroline and I would enroll. Hermione's not sure. <laughs> I think I agree with Aubrey. I think it's really difficult because, and I think Mike Levine is online here that, you know, the FEAST study, which was looking at fluid resuscitation, had an anticipated outcome. But actually, because we went down the line of doing a proper study, demonstrated that what we believed to be true was not true. And I think that it's really difficult to, uh, to tear that apart. And also, there is some evidence of azithromycin having hepatotoxicity. There are issues about uh, QT prolongation, which aren't an issue in pediatrics, but are in adults. Mm -hmm. um, and there are also the, the more mature members of our society are on other drugs, as Aubrey is typing, I see now. And so we need really the best kind of evidence. But I, I agree it's tricky. Um, good. Uh, um, it's Mike, uh, you, you raised the, the issue of the feast and I'm a complete believer that we have to do randomized control trials in order to actually learn from this. Again, uh, the difference between recommending a randomized trial and if you, if you yourself or your family were deteriorating, uh, not having the placebo arm rather than the uh, chloroquine or, or uh, uh, erythromycin would be a, a, a really difficult choice but unless we do a, a, a proper trial we're never going to know mm -hmm. and there won't be a, available enough chloroquine and we may do harm um, so I, I think we really have to do the trials and, and stick with our belief in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah okay thanks Mike. Good and um, that's really good I think are there any other questions from anybody? Oh, uh, Jethro, what are you saying? For healthcare workers who've had, oh, okay, that's a good question. So for healthcare workers who have proven to have the coronavirus, do they wear the same PPE when they come back to work? Um, oh, that's a good one. Now, the problem is, you know, once they're infected, you know, we do not know the, uh, immunity I learned from our uh, infectious disease colleague is, you know, your, your antibodies level will go down and it may not be long lasting. And uh, so 
given the fact that you know even if you someone is infected you know when you go back it would be a uh a good practice and also if you contaminate yourself and uh, what happened is because there are studies looking at how uh, viable these virus, these, these virus actually on glass surface, on cloth surface, on plastic last for two days. So you would want to keep the virus back in the hospital and yeah. not bringing back home. Yeah, that's a good yeah. point. I think, um, I think it's also one of the questions I was talking to the virology immunology team here at Imperial about was whether or not healthcare workers will have boosted um immune responses because of their recurrent exposure um, mm -hmm. and whether that's actually going to have a protective effect and I think we've got a student here yeah. who's hopefully going to gather some um mm -hmm. serology samples to look at that in a in a longitudinal fashion right. on healthcare sure. workers and non-healthcare workers i think i think we're really optimistic that it gives some immunity because that sure. also has implications for any vaccines that are coming through yeah. Yeah. so mm -hmm. uh, i think i'm going to keep my fingers crossed for that one um, all right very good. I think that's probably, um, that's, thank you so much for giving us your thank hour. You. Um, it was really interesting mm -hmm. and, and um, we're really grateful. And we hope that there isn't a resurgence um, uh, for, um, for you and for the rest of China, because I think that would get, also give us hope. So we'll be watching closely. Um, all right. All right. And thank you very much for your time. And thank you. Lots of people. Thank you. Thank you on the chat. All right. Yeah, Take thank care. you for having me. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.